Okay, now I get to introduce Hari. I, I told him I'd try and do something a little bit different. Um, so I'm not going to read any of this. You can read it yourself. So I, so Hari's um, uh, rightfully ex very proud of the students and postdocs that he has worked with. And I, um, I looked at the. He sent me a slide with the list, and and um, it, it, indeed he has he has um, contributed to a, a, a multiple generations of of um, stellar researchers and community members um, in, within networking. So it's a, uh, he's right to be proud of them. So I asked um, a selected set, mainly because selected because I thought that would answer my email quickly, um, for a word, one word to describe Hari. So I'm going to give you these words, and I'm going to invite you to think about whether one of them is a, is a, um, is a, fake, a fake word in there. Um, and uh, so here they are. Curious, energetic, actually also super energetic. One person cheated by hyphenating, inspiring, strategic, and cool. All right, so um, I'm going to let Hari talk, and you can figure out during the talk, make a guess if and if uh, which of these words is a ringer. Um, actually, I put in one of my own words based on serving on an NSF panel with Hari a long, long time ago, and that that word is um, stubborn. Um, all right, so without further ado, Hari, um, really looking forward to your talk and um, uh, congratulations on a well-deserved um, honor. Well, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Thumbs up, thumbs down. All right, great. This is what I got, uh, Dina. Well, I don't know if it's visible in the, let's see. Well, you can't quite see it with the, with the virtual background, but. Let me try to share my screen and do the zoom magic and see if this works. Okay. Um, again, thumbs up. Are the slides visible? All right, great, excellent. It's nothing like an enter and check <clears throat> to see if things uh, to see if things work. All right. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening, wherever you are. Uh, First of all, I want to thank um, the organizers of um, the conference. Just listening to the amount of work uh, it takes to put this together it is truly astonishing. Um, what I'd like to talk to you about over the next uh, 50 minutes or so is um, kind of a journey through research. And this is not a technical talk. It's actually quite a daunting talk to give. So if you uh, ever win this award, uh, let me tell you, it is, it is quite scary to be thinking about what you're going to tell the community that you love so much. And uh, um, what I want to focus on a little bit is my journey with my students, collaborators, postdocs and collaborators through research, focusing more on what inspired the work that um, uh, we've done and um, walk that path. And this is mainly intended, I would say, for people who are probably at the earliest stages of their career or perhaps are going through sort of a little bit of what am I doing next or uh, how do I go about figuring out what to do next. And um, in my uh, case, it has been extremely inspired by applications and hence the title Mind the App. Um, you might have seen from the London um, Underground that the sign is everywhere. And Nick McEwen, when he won his award uh, um, a few years ago, uh, gave his talk on Mind the Gap, focusing on the gap between industry, industry and academia. Um, in my case, it's Mind the App. So I want to tell you a little bit about it. Uh, I also should start with some thank yous. And uh, one of the biggest thank yous is to my family, uh, who's been very supportive. Uh, my grandparents, my grandmother, my, my parents, who I think are actually watching this, uh, my, my sister and uh, my wife and children. But let me give you a little bit of their reaction um, to, see, to see the kind of support that I get. So uh, over the past few days, I'd been really starting to panic about this talk and I was telling them about, about it. And, and, and this was the reaction from my oldest uh, who's um, getting into her second year uh, in college. And her reaction is, is very much, you know, is very understandable. She says, you just got an award and as a reward, they want you to do more work. Are you sure this is a community you want to be a part of? Well, so that's the kind of support I get. Um, my other daughter um, thought this was just an acceptance speech. And she said, don't worry about it. They'll play music to get, to get you off the stage. And then when she found that I had to speak for about an hour, her jaw dropped. And then she said, don't worry about it because no one's going to listen to anything for an hour unless it's a concert. So that's the, that's the other kind of support. Um, and my son was very cut and dry. 
um, he thought I got the award for finally fixing our home Wi-Fi uh, and then asked whether we could get a 3D printer. So, so that's kind of the, the support here, but I do thank them very much. Uh, the two honorees here are really, as, um, as um, Ellen mentioned, uh, uh, my students and my postdocs. And I've just given you um, some of the, uh, all of them here. Uh, there's roughly about 30 students, uh, including the current students and about 10 postdocs. And almost everything, in fact, everything I'm going to talk about is work that's done with them. And truth be told, many of the key ideas are theirs. Um, so I was just looking back and I asked some of my students to send some pictures and uh, this is the collage of uh, them. Many of them look pretty young. Some of them even graduate. This is a note to my current students. There's always a finish line here. And uh, after about a year and a half, I visited, or maybe about a year, I visited um, CSAIL, the lab, uh, a few weeks ago. And I took this picture. You can see a little bit of this, of this door there. And it turns out 16 of my students were all in this one office over the generation. So I can't wait to be back, as I'm sure you can't all wait to be back, back at work. So where do research inspirations come from? So that's really what I want to talk about and give examples to, to uh, the work that we've done. Um, and um, ultimately, we're all about making things different or making things better. That's really what research is about, doing something new that hasn't been done before. Um, and if I look at all research, except for the occasional true geniuses that emerge from time to time, maybe once in many, many decades, all research builds on something else that's already there. But sometimes it's not very clear where these ideas come from. So if I look at networking in particular, I see three types of research that happen. And this may be true for computer systems more broadly. The first are technology trends. There are people who are absolute experts at technology trends. They study this, they understand it quite deeply, and then they use this to guide their research. And I'll give you some examples from our community. One of the, uh, the most interesting and fantastic technology trends related talks uh, was last year's um, keynote by Amin Vadat, and he just lays out the technology trend. There's other examples. Nick McEwen talks about technology trends in quite some detail. George, George Verghese um, had a lot of that driving his network algorithms work and just talking about the last uh, several years. Uh, I got to say, this doesn't work for me. For someone who kind of barely passed the computer architecture course, uh, this is something where uh, I actually find it hard to understand technology trends. I mean, I know things get faster with time and things get smaller, but really deeply understanding it to drive research is something that I've tried to learn, but it has not worked for me. So if you're starting off or in the middle of your career and it doesn't work for you, that's okay. There are other ways. The second thing that happens in networking is people build great careers out of operational expertise and know-how. They just know how things are done and therefore they know how to do it better. Um, examples are gender experts talk from a couple of years ago, Albert Greenberg, and there's many other examples of this as well. They just kind of understand it. And I myself have been fortunate to collaborate with people who know this, and uh, that has been very helpful as well. But the thing that fundamentally really gets me excited, and I think this is true for many of my students as well, is applications. Just the idea that you could use applications, the things that drive me the most are things that I want to use. You look at applications and you say, what can I do to make these applications better? What can we do to improve networks and systems to make applications better. And the nice thing about applications is we all use them. And I think there are applications we often, we all love. And you might find an application that you enjoy or you want to use, and you can start looking at how to make it better. The path toward winning with applications, winning research with applications is not as difficult because you don't need a whole lot of prior knowledge. What you might need more of is perhaps creativity. Uh, I'll go back to my own uh, thesis work on TC TCP over wireless. I joined the research group, Randy Katz, uh, kind of sight unseen, took me on as a student. He really didn't know much about me. And uh, he asked what I wanted to work on. And I strategically answered, well, whatever you're interested in. And then I looked around the room and he had this laptop. Uh, and, sorry, he had a, a, a wireless card. And I really didn't know what it was. It was one of the first wireless cards in the mid 90s. And I said, you know, it sounds like mobile computing is very interesting to me. And it turns out that was the right answer because he was getting interested in that. Uh, and I started by taking this wireless card and trying to telnet into or log in into a remote machine from this laptop that he'd given me. And I found that from time to time, the connection would just drop. Just didn't understand what was happening. And then I started 
looking at this, there was a prior paper by Ramon Caceres uh, and uh, Iftori that had been published just recently. And I said, oh, there is something about TCP here. It's using these protocols and the connections are getting dropped. And that's how I started. It was just to try to log in. And that led to an entire line of work that eventually found me my PhD thesis. So sometimes, in fact, always journeys of a long distance start with one or two small steps. And it really doesn't matter as long as it's a positive step. So I want to go through some examples. One of the projects that I worked on early when I came to MIT with Dave Anderson, uh, Franz Kashuk, and Robert Morris was RON, Resilient Overlay Networks. I think many people in our community know about this project, but the motivation was very simple. We observed that we wanted to do group communication. We wanted to actually do teleconferencing and applications like that between people distributed across the network, a small groups of people, maybe a dozen people, about four or five, a dozen people. And um, we found that the internet wasn't really that reliable. It was taking a long time to recover from outages. And a lot of papers have recently been written about how BGP would take a long time to recover from outages. And um, we'd also been aware uh, of a recent paper from the University of Washington, Stefan Savage, uh, Weatherall and Anderson and others on finding that the triangle inequality doesn't hold on the internet, that you could, uh, the performance between A and B would often be better if you went through C. And we looked at this and applied it to fundamentally improving application level performance and built this overlay network um, with, with some very interesting, simple ideas. And today uh, we find that uh, in many universities, it's actually taught to undergraduates. Um, and I think this is actually an interesting idea where it's motivated by applications that you want to use and you find some problems with it in the network. And then the basic idea is if the path between uh, the direct path on the internet doesn't work, just find indirected paths by which to uh, send your data. It's a very conceptually simple idea underneath which there's a lot of interesting networking design and systems design. Uh, but I actually think this has had a lot of impact. I know a lot of real world systems that essentially use this idea. And in fact, in my own career, 13 years later, um, um, as part of a company that I co-founded and which still runs, um, we were working on safe driving, taking data from mobile sensors and delivering it to the cloud on an Amazon data center and processing that data to measure how well people drive to um, motivate and incentivize safer driving. Uh, so this is uh, sort of the app that's used. The sensor data comes from the phones and from an IoT device called the TAG. And we found in 2014, we just deployed with one of our early customers in South Africa and things were working. And then for a certain small class of users from a particular cellular network in South Africa called MTN um, to AWS US West S3, the uploads were failing. Everything else was working. AWS was working, other, AW, other network paths were working. And we tried to help them debug this. Lots of entities involved, the usual trace routes and pings and really not a whole lot else. It took over a week for it to be resolved. In fact, finally, we don't even know if it got resolved. It just stopped, started working. And everybody said it's not their fault. In the meantime, we built our own RON for delivery. Fortunately, we knew how to do this. And this is still in use. So we have a RON running between the cellular networks that are delivering the data and these data centers. Just one example from personal experience. It's still in use today. And uh, over 10% to 15% of all data delivered in the system goes through indirect paths, even today from cellular networks around the world, and especially in several countries. So I actually think these simple ideas that improve an application have a lot of legs and impact beyond the original uh, purposes to which they were, uh, for which they were designed. Uh, I now want to next talk about CORD um, and this work on distributed hash tables, which was also um, motivated by wanting to build interesting distributed applications. Uh, and so this is probably very familiar to everyone. It's uh, distributed hash tables were quite the rage uh, 15, 20 years ago and have continued to be uh, interesting for a variety of reasons I'll get to uh, in, on the next slide. Uh, but the motivation for this really was again, applications. Uh, it wasn't about building a better system. It was really looking at peer-to-peer -peer applications and saying, what are the things that they all have and what can we do to identify something in common? But the real story behind Cord um, is that it really started with a very small step. Uh, there was a system called Freenet which was a peer-to-peer -peer storage system. Not many people know about it today, but it was deeply inspirational to us working on COD and to me personally. And the system provides anonymity 
of data delivery. You could put data into Freenet and they would name the data with flat identifiers that were sort of hashes of the content. And you could then search for it by that content. And they had the data stored on this peer-to-peer -peer network. The trouble with it was that the routing to get the data was pretty flaky. In fact, there was a throwaway sentence in this uh, document or paper that said that because we want anonymity and because we want it to scale, uh, we really can't guarantee that files will always be found. And our goal in CORD was really to just, it started by just saying, can we just do a better free net? Um, can we just provide a way by which you can put stuff into a distributed peer-to-peer -peer system and have a way to provide guaranteed lookups? And of course, CORD and distributed hash tables more broadly, uh, there were multiple done at the same time, like CAN uh, from Berkeley and Tapestry, also from Berkeley and uh, Pastry from, uh, uh, Rice and Microsoft. Uh, I don't know their motivations, but ours was actually a very modest motivation. Can we just do a better free net or a better Nutella peer-to-peer -peer system? Uh, today, if I reflect back on it, and like I said, this is not a real technical talk. I'm just going to talk about the inspirations and some of the impacts. Um, you know, I was thinking about what is the what are the sort of intellectual impacts of DHTs in general and CORD in particular. One thing is that they're often studied in every networking-related course. And the reason for that is it's a great source for quiz questions. It gets students thinking about how to design scalable systems with simple protocols and teaches them routing, but it does it in a way that allows for a lot of interesting questions to be asked. So of course, there's a sort of pedagogic impact, but I think it helped popularize distributed consistent hashing, which was a prior invention of consistent hashing, but in a distributed way. Um, a real simplicity of design that I think is quite appealing and really popularized the use of key value stores as a building block for applications, because in this project, my collaborators and colleagues spend a lot of time building various applications. And one group of these was flat names being used in distributed services. So even though it started with this application that was quite modest, the ideas generalized quite nicely. So the idea of using flat names in distributed services. So with Mike Walfish and Scott Schenker, we worked on looking at whether you could redesign the web with just flat names building on top of this naming structure. In fact, by this time, you're agnostic to whether it's served with a DHT or some other technology, it doesn't matter. And then we generalized it into thinking about naming more broadly. And today I'm actually, uh, we're pleased to see that there are many systems that underneath may even be structured with a DNS type of name, but inside those URLs is actually flat names that allow for data to be replicated and moved around um, in quite a scalable way. So although it didn't quite pan out the way we had envisioned in the architecture, many of the ideas are actually around in the context of individual systems. The other area that was quite exciting is the use of flat names in network architecture. So one example of this is the Accountable Internet Protocol, which showed that if you made these names flat and self-certifying, you get a lot of authentication that comes out for free because you could uh, make them be derived from public keys and use DHT-like technology for name resolution. And I think that one of the things that this has led to is a lot of future internet proposals and clean slate proposals whose ideas might survive into the future. Um, in fact, all pretty much all of them use some form of flat naming for, for various levels of identification and addressing. And this idea of location independent naming uh, to the extent possible is, is a very powerful idea. Last but not least, the variety of dynamic stabilization protocols that are used now in a variety of data centers as well. So again, the details may be different, but the concept of dealing with node arrival and um, leaves, uh, leaving and joining of nodes is something that is quite a lasting principle. I now want to switch gears to talk about congestion control, which is the other area um, that um, I've spent a lot of time on. And the perspective that uh, I have had on congestion control, and I think many of my students have had by, in the way we think about it is not fundamentally as a resource management problem. I know that in networking, we think of congestion control as there's a scarce resource, you gotta figure out how to allocate that scarce resource. And indeed that's how we teach it. It's probably a natural way to teach the subject um, or to learn the subject. But my own internal driver for congestion control is from an applications perspective. You have a group of applications running on a computer or perhaps on a network, and you want to share network resources amongst them, but you want to do it in a way that benefits each application in the best possible way, because they may all have different 
outcomes they they seek from the network. And the paper that really has, in fact, inspired me greatly, there are two papers, I'll get to the second one uh, in momentarily, but the first paper is the application level framing paper by Clark and Tenenhaus. And this paper talks about two ideas, ALF and integrated layer processing, which is about a technology to make implementations quick. Uh, the ALF idea for me has been a very, very deeply impactful idea. It talks about how you design network data APIs that um, allow for protocols to understand what application data units are. And the key new idea that is motiv that motivated us uh, when we started this work, uh, which I started with Srini Session and others on the congestion manager, was to use the application level framing idea to think differently about congestion control. So the congestion manager is an architecture to share congestion information, but the real story, the real, I think intellectually interesting idea is how it can use application level framing in congestion control. First, to benefit applications like the web, where there are many concurrent connections that wish to share information. And second, and probably more important, to benefit things like video um, and audio conferencing applications or streaming applications. So the conceptual idea is to centralize all of the congestion logic into a module and share this congestion information. But the sharing is only one part of it. The other part of it, which is, I think is more important, is the API between the application and the congestion module, the congestion manager module that embeds and embodies application level framing principle. So rather than sending data into the network stack and having it hold on to it uh, in a big buffer, instead you put the buffering into the application and you take the congestion control as much as possible outside of the data path. So you just exercise control decisions. And by doing so, you can late bind and tell the application at the last possible instant that it's ready to send. And at that point, the application can decide what to send. Uh, much to my disappointment, the congestion manager architecture has not really been widely deployed, although I think it should be. Haven't really figured out why, except a couple of years ago in 2017, 18, working with Mohammad Ali Zadeh and uh, several of our students, Akshay Narayan, uh, Pratish Goyal, and Frank Angelosi, we had this idea that um, maybe the problem is that the CM doesn't quite get completely out of the data path. So we now have an architecture called the congestion control plane that removes it out of the data path completely. And perhaps this might be another shot at embedding application level framing ideas uh, into shared congestion management. And perhaps that might, might see some greater uh, practical success. But um, I was thinking back about some of the work we did on the congestion manager and found uh, this interesting video i'm trying to i don't know if i'm going to get let me see i think i forgot to set the screen share up with i'm going to stop and try it again i think i need to share my audio excuse me for a minute okay so i found this video from 20 years ago that talks about some of the work we were doing on congestion management and uh, mobile computing. Um, and this is actually a video with a voiceover by a uh, young David Anderson, who was uh, my student then. And just think back to 20 years ago, this was before smartphones and so on. We were working with these handle devices called uh, the iPacks. So I'm gonna play this video, it's a two minute clip. And this is just to go back 20 years to see what it is we were doing then. And I hope the audio works. So let me start playing this. Oxygen TV is a working prototype that delivers streaming live media over the internet to mobile clients connected by wireless links. Oxygen TV uses servers that capture TV streams and encode them in real time, transmission protocols that enable the stream servers to adapt to changing network conditions such as loss rates and available bandwidth, and viewing software that runs on handheld devices. The result is a mobile handheld television on which users can view live TV from a wide variety of sources. How does Oxygen TV work? It uses a farm of servers to capture cable television feeds and encode them in real time as MPEG-4 streams. A user's handheld contacts a front-end dispatch server using a standard protocol, RTSP, and describes the channel it wants. The dispatch server routes this request to the appropriate server in the farm, after which the handheld communicates directly with that server. To adapt to changing network conditions, particularly over wireless links, the servers use a network software module called the Congestion Manager. The Congestion Manager uses a congestion control algorithm to determine current network conditions and provides this information to the streaming server. 
The server in turn determines the best way to encode the television signals. Here, two handhelds receive the same video stream. The top handheld uses a standard TCP connection, which degrades the quality of its image when the network is congested. In contrast, the bottom handheld uses Oxygen TV's <coughs> congestion manager and adaptive transmission protocol to maintain the quality of its image even when the network is congested. In addition to being a display device, the handheld can operate as a remote control when it is equipped with a Cricut location sensing listener. Here, as Michelle enters a new room, his Cricut enabled handheld discovers a bigger and better display. With a single click, he transforms his handheld to a remote control and migrates the TV stream to the better display. I think this is really cool considering it was 20 years ago, but um, it's interesting to see how much of this has completely become commonplace today and uh, um, uh, something where, um, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's fun to go back 15, 20 years and see what it is you were doing then and to see whether some of the things you worked on became real or didn't become real. So um, what I want to talk about now is the technology that was mentioned right at the end of that video, which is the Cricket location system, um, which is really more of a, uh, a little bit of networking, but a lot of sensing and, and mobile computing. So again, the motivation here was to provide location capabilities to navigate people inside and GPS uh, still doesn't work indoors um, and didn't work indoors in those days. And uh, we also wanted to look at uh, some sort of physical gaming where you could play games on the computer but move in the physical world and want to track location. We wanted to see how far we could push that. So the idea here was actually very simple again. It was to build a network of beacons that were mounted on the walls and ceilings and use a combination of radio and ultrasound have the network, the beacon self configure into a coordinate system and use the time difference of arrival between radio signals and ultrasound sent at the same time. Radio travels at the speed of light, um, ultrasound travels at the speed of sound. Uh, and therefore you could uh, um, look at the time difference between um, you know, the fact that sound travels at one foot per millisecond, light is practically instantaneous, and count the number of milliseconds between when you receive the radio signal and the corresponding sound signal, and use that to uh, localize. Um, what's really interesting about this is, you know, we built, uh, I think, over a million units, uh, completely open source, and, and uh, some companies took it and built it and had it deployed in various places. I think it was a modest commercial success, uh, probably not a great commercial success at all, uh, a, great, a very interesting research success. But what I want to point out here is sometimes ideas just come back. And so you fast forward to 2020, and of course, we're in the middle of COVID and we're looking at uh, one of the technologies from our field that could help us contact tracing. And with a group of researchers uh, uh, at Lincoln Labs, uh, MIT, the Mass General Hospital, and IBM, uh, we revisited this idea and um, uh, uh, some of the people on this team implemented a similar idea on, on mobile phones. It turns out you could drive the speakers and microphones on your phones at ultrasonic frequencies and use the very similar idea to develop a more accurate contact tracing framework uh, on these phones. So sometimes it's, and often from academia and from research, it's the ideas that last, whether the artifacts last or not is not that important. The ideas are quite important. So sometimes it just takes a really long time to find uh, a technology is true calling. The other project I want to touch upon a little bit is the Cartel project, which is a deep collaboration with Sam Madden, um, which again was inspired by an application. In this case, it was simply, what if we put sensors on cars and just measure what's happening? And the first project we worked on there was, this was back in 2005, there was no inexpensive cellular network capabilities. So we first built a vehicular Wi-Fi system where we built devices that would, uh, and partnered with local taxi companies to put devices in cars to just measure traffic conditions uh, and road surface conditions and built a vehicular Wi-Fi system that would deliver the data. Uh, and then a couple of years later, um, took this idea to measure road surface conditions because the Boston area, as you may know, if you've driven here has pretty lousy roads. So using this technology to measure the surface conditions of roads uh, into something called the pothole patrol. Um, a few years later, we found that we could take the same technology, but then now 
put it on smartphones to measure people's driving. And this is now a company that I co-founded uh, called Cambridge Mobile Telematics that again came about from a very simple idea, which was let's just put sensors, a mobile sensor technology on cars and simply measure what's happening. And um, initially we had to build the network to do it then started using the cellular network. And now um, this is helping millions of users around the world in about 20 countries, uh, help, keep a peop uh, help make people safer drivers. So let me pause now and turn to another research area inspired by applications, which is something that we're all uh, using now, uh, which is video over wireless. Uh, in 2012, um, we started working on this because um, I decided that I would start driving home by 5 p.m. every day um, uh, and wanted to do audio Skype meetings with my students. And uh, Keith Winstein was one of the students. And we started doing these Skype uh, conferences uh, with a small group of people. Some of them were on video and some were on the audio. And we found that it basically didn't work. Uh, and I remember uh, when it, it was extremely interesting and frustrating because we found that we could, we then ran these tests ourselves where I would count 1001, 1002, 1003. And then Keith or someone on the other side would tell me when they heard my 1001 and we would find that it sometimes take multiple seconds. So of course, this is now a well-known issue. It's been well measured, which is that wireless throughput can change very dramatically with time, particularly with mobility. And so that inspired a direction of um, very interesting research that lasted many, many years. I'm just gonna walk you through a thread of how that came about. So the first uh, project here um, that we worked on was Keith and Anirudh Sivaram and another student worked on a system called Sprout, where they said, what matters to this application is not just throughput. We need high throughput, but we don't want data coming too late. So they formulated this problem of saying, I want 95% of my data to show up within D milliseconds. D might be 100 milliseconds. And I want to design a protocol to do that. And in a cellular network, most of the delays, queuing delays are self-inflicted because the network partitions users from each other. And they came up with a very interesting idea that allowed uh, that, that inferred the current rate from the interarrival distribution at the receiver, and then built a simple Bayesian model to predict future link rates and convey the prediction to the center before congestion. But the other interesting part of this was this utility function that was combining throughput and delay. So uh, this turned out to be a very interesting protocol. Um, and an example result, you could then plot on a curve like this, which plots throughput on the y-axis and the delay on the x-axis on a sort of log-like scale, but it's flipped. So the lower delays that are better are on the right side. Um, and, and we now use this type of plot, and I see this being used a lot in the community. And to, my, to the best of my knowledge, Keith Winstone came up with this type of plot for the first time, and you see the schemes all compare with each other on this. And what's interesting about a framing like this with an application level objective between throughput and, and the type of delay that applications care about is you can now start to create protocol design contests, which we've run now in courses. Again, they had this idea to create a networking course. And we now use this both for this type of protocol and for uh, video available bitrate algorithms where you want to adapt the video bitrate to transmission. And it gets students really excited. They come up with protocols that are on this curve and many of the protocols might be under the curve and there's an efficient frontier that gets created when you take the results of many, many students coming up with their own protocols and you plot them, you sort of get a natural frontier, which is quite exciting and interesting. Um, that's what human generated protocols are able to do. Now, one of the inspirations in this line of work for me has been this paper by Scott Schenker from um, the 90s. The, uh, I don't know how many people in our community really have read this paper. It wasn't at SIGCOM, um, but this paper is really interesting because it talks about, there's a sentence here which says that what matters is how happy does an architecture make users? Network performance must not be measured in terms of network-centric quantities. It's about objectives. So we started thinking about how we might apply this idea. And there's also a line of work from Frank Kelly that talks about utility functions. And um, we proposed this idea of looking at application level objectives, a proxy for application level objectives that combines throughput and delay in a sort of, um, in a logarithmic type of a function. And 
the first project that we worked on here um, was Keith's, uh, part of Keith's thesis dissertation, uh, PhD dissertation on Remy, which was using machine generated congestion control and seeing whether it could beat human generated congestion control. And what's interesting about Remy was in all of the simulation based experiments that we did, but what we thought of was realistic simulation, Remy absolutely kicked ass. It, it performed way better than many of the human generated schemes on this curve. Uh, but yet there was something somewhat non-robust about it. When you're outside of the training range, it didn't do that well. In fact, it performed quite poorly. But even within the training range in practice, subsequent work has shown that there's something more about real networks that makes it very difficult for AI-based algorithms or for these computer synthesized algorithms to really do better than humans in congestion control. But seeing these results behind Remy, um, one of the challenges that we decided to tackle um, was whether human generated protocols could in fact start to compete well in at least in simulation and ideally in practice as well with Remy like protocols. And one of those projects was a project with uh, my student Venkatarun called COPA, which is really inspired originally by aiming to beat the computer. And COPA is based on a very interesting idea, again, inspired by this application meaningful utility function, which is the log of the throughput minus delta times log of the delays. So the idea is you want high throughput and low delay. So this function is somewhat a natural function for that. And the intuition in COPA in this algorithm is that if you aim for a target rate that's inversely proportional to a measured queuing delay, it could do well. Now, it turns out for a variety of reasons, it's really hard to estimate the right queuing delay statistic, and that's what this paper does. But this algorithm turns out to work really well, um, even better than in simulation on certain production networks. And Facebook today uses it, I'm told, uh, for um, video uploads in, in, for mobile networks. So again, this is an example of an application-inspired piece of research, which had nothing to do with improving network performance, but really had to do with trying to improve a, uh, an application that cares both about high throughput and low delay. Um, the most recent line of work that we've done on this is a scheme called Axel Brake Control or ABC that extends this idea with in-network feedback where the idea is let's use this ECN information that's available on routers today to mark that ECN bit, but use it not only to signal congestion, but also to signal an increase in rate. And it's an example of an explicit control protocol. And it's a lot like XCP, but a lot less verbose. And the summary information, the, the result from here is that it actually performs comparably or even better than XCP um, in cellular networks. And I'm gonna come back to this point about the power of a very narrow interface with one or a small number of bits of information being a more robust way paradoxically than having a lot of information. So I'm gonna come back to that point in a few minutes. Uh, let me skip this. So, uh, so far I've talked about research on networking uh, inspired by applications, which has to do with, you know, uh, started off with looking at overlay networks, uh, flat names with distributed hash table, looked at congestion control um, and then video uh, and talked really about uh, and also talked about um, some wireless sensing work in between, all of which were application inspired uh, research projects. But now I want to turn to today and to the future and ask how resilient are applications and what can we do to make applications more resilient? Um, and this is based on some observations here. I'm gonna start first with the news of my sitcom award which actually I did not get an email or any information about. It came from this text message from my student Anirudh, who told me that he saw on Facebook that I won the Sikkim Award and there was a thread. And, and when he texted this to me, I had absolutely no idea. Uh, in fact, I had no idea of an official notification for quite some time uh, until I went into Facebook and then I saw this little red dot to a Facebook messenger message where Dina um, said, what's the best email address to reach you? I've been trying the CCL one, but I'm not sure, it's not working. And then we go into this thread, uh, suffice it to say, I'm still waiting for this email from CCL, although I did receive it at another address. So this is an example in my view of perhaps applications have become less resilient. Uh, email used to work pretty well 20 years ago. Uh, if it didn't work, it would bounce. If it worked, uh, you'd, you'd receive it. 
And I see this in many, many applications. I mean, here's one, I just went into the news article, you, you look at resilient or you look at robust applications. And here's one, freezing video calls are among the top 10 Zoom bugbears, this is from England. Um, and it says also that, um, you know, we put up with nearly a quarter of their video calls freezing and 15% cut out altogether. In fact, I think you look at Sigcom itself, it's a networking conference. And yet, I think we don't really have real confidence in the resilience of our applications that I think this might be the only talk at Sigcom that's live and maybe some of the panels are live, but everything else, we pre-record the talks, we deliver the talks, and then we're going to distribute it from some place where we think we have really good network bandwidth and not rely on live streaming. Um, and it's probably because we're not really sure that this stuff works, push comes to shop. And that's really what I wanna talk about in the next few minutes and ask what we can do to improve um, applications, which is ultimately what our goal should be. Uh, app networks serve applications and work on networking should really be to improve applications. So if you look at what has happened to apps, app architectures have become extremely complicated over the past 20, 25 years. In software evolution, it started from like desktop applications to then become web applications. And so we put these modules out on the web, which then became components. So components means we have no idea now how anything is implemented. In fact, they're from various third parties and we connect them together to build our software. And then with the advent, particularly of cloud computing, these became microservices. And now we have hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of microservices, which then over time spread not only within one data center or one cloud, but across multiple data centers, and then over the network to the edges, to things in the middle of the network, which you know with things like network function virtualization and various types of middle boxes. And then these components are spreading to the ends with mobile and desktop and IoT and cyber physical systems. So now if you think about say networked autonomous vehicles in the future, you're gonna have hundreds of thousands of these components running everywhere across the network into the edges, into the cloud. And there's a massive amount of complexity. Now microservices, which are these little tiny components with well-defined interfaces or APIs sound like a really good idea. But I do wonder, and I think there's some recent work that people have been investigating this, that these may have made things a little less resilient. So I call this death by 100,000 distributed microservices because each call to a microservice, especially across the network is a potential fault. And ironically, now when I've been involved in commercial software, what I found is ironically handling other people's errors makes your own microservice or your own little component more complicated. It leads to more race conditions because most of these things, many of these things are asynchronous in nature as well. And you have to keep track of other, other components um, what the, those other components are telling you. And someone said, a call to a microservice is the role of the dice. You don't know what's going to happen. Now, as I said, components and services are distributed across multiple data centers, across the network, and also across organizations. So how can we achieve resilience in this world? So there are possible solutions here. There's massive amounts of logging and tracing and telemetry. And frankly, I'm not sure that's going to really solve the problem. It leads to a lot greater amount of data and nobody knows the internals of any other microservice. It's really hard to understand what someone else's logs mean and I may not even want to share my log. What about software defined X or Y or Z? I'm not sure that's the solution either. What about AI? Well, all of these things, formal verification, maybe Google and Facebook and, and Amazon will just solve it. Or Microsoft will just solve it. I don't think all of these are really the, um, the answer. Uh, maybe we need to be thinking about these a little bit differently. And to me, here's an idea, and it's speculative and provocative. I'm just going to throw it out there to see if it inspires more research. And it's an area that I would like to get into and start working on next. And that's why I want to talk about it here. To me, these distributed microservices spread across the wide area and across many organizations looks like a really large network. This is a picture I, I stole from somewhere. It's under Creative Commons. I forgot where I stole it from. But you, this, uh, this was an example with tens of thousands of these little microservices spread across the network. And it really starts to look to me like an internet probably of 20, 25 years ago. And that's just a single application. Now, maybe there's a way we could apply what I'll call internet thinking. This is like computational thinking and everybody talks about computational thinking. There's internet thinking. 
So what is it that we do in networking that are more are, are really fundamental intellectual ideas that perhaps we could export to other fields? Because one thing we're very good at in networking is adopting ideas from other fields to solve our problems. And to me, there are three. The first is we know how to deal with scale a lot better than most other communities. And maybe we have something to say about it to other people. Uh, I think we know how to deal with feedback-based network control and routing systems. The idea of making progress in the face of a lot of noise and uncertainty in a large system with really clever and simple signals and really good principles on where functions get placed. And then I think we're really quite good at competitive cooperation. You know, our routing system is a good example of this. Different organizations, they don't really trust each other, but they have to cooperate to get something going. And I think these modern applications are a lot like this. They resemble this. Maybe there's something we can apply from our bread and butter thinking to improving the resilience of applications. So here's a, an idea. Um, and the idea here is to reject verbosity. It's to, in fact, use the idea of very narrow interfaces to our benefit. The idea here is rather than share these logs and every component tells everybody about its state. We have to solve the problem of fault isolation and identification by looking through massive amounts of data. Let's instead make a virtue out of the fact that in networking, we reject verbosity in many cases to go to a small narrow interface. We signal congestion in one or two or four bits, usually one or two bits. Um, and that has worked really well because what it does is it makes it intentionally not expressive about the semantics of how something is computed doesn't say what the state of a component means exactly, but just conveys the high level meaning. All I want to know is if it's a red or a green or a yellow. Is it working or not working? Or maybe it's somewhat working. And I don't really have a position on whether it should be a one bit or two bits or four bits, but it should be some number of bits. And this narrow information interface, but millions of way of computing, it means that we could evolve these components just like we could take ECM uh, or with a small number of bits and have a variety of different algorithms, RED and CODL and DCTCP and all of these different algorithms that all compute their state in different ways, but put it onto a small number of bits. And I actually think this is an attribute shared by ideas that will actually succeed in large network systems. The more I think about what ideas have succeeded in our community, they've tended to be ones where the information exchange between disparate components is extremely narrow and whose semantics is somewhat vague. It's only directionally specified. And the way in which you compute it is quite arbitrary. And so this idea of hiding complexity behind narrow interfaces, I think is one of the things that has made the internet successful, the IP layer itself being an example of that. But the control side is more illustrative. Um, explicit congestion notification versus XCP. I think XCP is a fantastic, terrific scheme, but I think it specifies too much. It tells us everything about the rate and not only how to compute the rate, but how to specify. If instead we were to map it into a small amount of information, we probably could do better. And that's what our work on ABC has actually shown. And I think fewer bits can hide a wider range. It is true that a fewer bits hide a wider range of component behavior, so more things could go wrong. Uh, I want to put a plug out to Venkatarun's talk in the next session about how he applies this idea to congestion control by saying, there's lots of things a component can do and put it out onto a narrow interface and formal verification could help in improving our ability to reason about such systems. And maybe this is a way in which we can go forward with applications into the future. So let me spend a couple of minutes talking about the sitcom community and then I'll wrap up. I found that it's traditional in these talks is a great way to provide some sort of thanks and also guidance to the community. Uh, I think our community is extremely welcoming and supportive. Uh, I've been on enough promotion and hiring committees over the years. I've seen a lot of recommendation letters uh, from people in our community, about people in our community, and it is an exceptionally supportive community. And there are other communities in computer science which are really not as supportive. Um, and now, I will say when you read your sitcom reviews from time to time, you might think otherwise because you see that they absolutely slam your ideas. Uh, a great idea might receive one star on your paper, but we don't see that in how we support each other. But I will say that it, the internet is a massive success. So there's a sense in which our program committees have tended to have the sense of being gatekeepers. And I was extremely happy and gratified to hear 
Nandita and Aditya talk about how they ran the PC this year. I think it really sounds like a, a, the way forward for us. And I think even though the SIGCOM community has really not been the gatekeeper of the internet for many, many years, and perhaps never was, we've always felt that we gotta be really careful. What if it gets deployed? What, will it break the internet? Guys, it, nothing is gonna break the internet. None of our ideas. Let's be welcoming of ideas. And I think we've had an excessively high bar for deployability in papers. And it's often hard to achieve both innovation and deployability. What matters are the ideas. It doesn't matter if it can be deployed today or not. We don't know how the future will unfold. And I don't think PCs have a really good way to figure out if something is going to unfold into the future, how it's going to unfold into the future. Uh, our community is expanding fast. I got these two graphs from my students, Venkat Arun and Akshay Narayan. Uh, the left graph just shows the number of distinct authors in all sitcom sponsored conferences. And you can see the spikes starting to happen in terms of this growth. And this is fantastic. Uh, we don't have statistics on how many people submitted papers. It's not accessible to us. We just looked at all authors in all sitcom events. And you can see that this number has grown. And the sitcom conference itself, the number of distinct authors has grown. Now, the acceptance rates have slightly gone up in the last two years. I think they've gone up um, um, in the last two years, but not quite a lot until then. But the number of accepted paper, uh, the, the number of submitted papers has been roughly stable. The number of authors has gone up. And what's happening is this picture on the right. There's a lot more authors per paper. And uh, this picture here on the left shows the number of submissions and the number of accepted papers. And you can see the last two years, the number of accepted papers has gone up, which is, I think, a really good trend. So I have some advice here for our community if I may be uh, bold enough to provide some advice. I do think it's getting more and more difficult for our students who really are the next generation. Um, even the best groups anecdotally might have a 35 or 40% acceptance rate. 33% uh, acceptance rate means three attempts before publishing. And often these papers don't really get a lot better in those subsequent attempts. Maybe they do with the first attempt, the first retransmission, but not after that. So what's our modus operandi? Well, the paper gets rejected, you make some fixes, you retransmit it. And maybe you submit something else too because you're now part of collaborations that are doing that. The overall capacity hasn't changed all that much. And the reviews don't have memory. We don't provide, we don't take these reviews from the previous submission and send them along. So for a community that invented congestion control and hybrid retransmission schemes and partial packet recovery and so on, we could do a lot better. We're just going for congestion collapse here with a tired PC that's overloaded. So I would argue instead, research should just favor ideas over whether it's immediately useful. Because I really don't think program committees can predict the future. And they probably can't even predict what ideas are gonna be great or not. That's why you have the test of time award. Only time will tell. And I would request that we be a lot more forgiving about whether a paper solves a real problem. I think we should over index on whether the idea is really interesting, we should not compromise correctness, and we should just allow for interesting ideas to be accepted. And I think this is what I heard today about how the PC was operating. Uh, the other thing I would really like to see happen is removing the end of January stress. It is a total pain in the neck for students. And maybe think about rolling deadlines the way VLDB does. And last but not least, we probably will cover this in the community session. I'd love to see more papers accepted. There's a lot of really good work and the community has expanded enormously. And now that we can record and store everything, perhaps we don't have to worry about keeping everything single track. Um, I wanna end by again, thanking my many students and postdocs, as well as uh, three people in my group who've, been, um, um, who've helped out with various projects over the years. Um, and to thank my many collaborators and mentors in the community, I don't have time to name them all, um, but there are many, many people originally at Berkeley, uh, where I was a graduate student, then at MIT, and then in our wider community. They've just been absolutely fantastic to, to work with, and I am deeply grateful to them. So in conclusion, uh, my pitch here to all of you is that applications can inspire research, just the way in which technology trends or operational knowledge can. Um, just to summarize some of the lessons, um, I think application layer overlays, um, whether it be inspired by peer-to-peer -peer or things like Ron can improve resilience. Uh, flat names and key values, I think are powerful for distributed applications, another lesson that I, I've learned. Uh, I think it's very interesting to frame congestion control not as an enabler for application adaptation, 
but really, uh, I'm sorry, as an enabler for application adaptation and think about what it does for applications, rather than thinking about it as a pure resource management problem, that mindset might lead to better ideas or different ideas. Um, the other lesson I've learned is to deploy ideas, just get out of the data path as much as possible. The more you're on the data path, the more things can break, the more skittish people are. And I think SDNs are one example of this, but there are many, many other examples um, that I think I've shown some instances of today. And last but not least, uh, I wanna make this pitch for a really narrow interface. And this may be different from what some other people have said in our community. I actually think really narrow interfaces enable scale and resilience. And maybe we can apply this to application architectures to make them more resilient in the future. And last but not least, uh, I'd like our community to over-index on ideas without compromising correctness. And really all of us question our own priors, our prior assumptions on whether a problem is real or not. Let's face it, we just don't know. The future can unfold in very, very interesting ways. So I thank you very much for your attention, for giving me this opportunity. And once again, thank you so much for this wonderful award. Thank you, Hari, that was a wonderful talk. You are an inspiration to me and to many others like me and to many students. So it was great to hear your reflections on many years of excellent research. Um, so I'm here to actually handle your Q&A, Hari. Um, so we have a, a one question in, in, in the Zoom chat uh, window and maybe one question, a couple of questions in uh, on Slack. So whoever is listening, please post your questions to the Slack channel. I'll be monitoring that. So I guess the first question was from Ellen, which she uh, left here before she uh, signed off. Which word best describes you? <laughs> Curious, energetic, super energetic, Inspiring, strategic, cool, stubborn. <laughs> uh, well, I hope it's not stubborn or strategic. Uh, well, a strategic may or may not be a good thing. It's really not for me to say it's for how others perceive me, but uh, I think that one thing I feel, I, I don't feel I'm the smartest person in the room in many situations, but I think that uh, I'd like to think of myself as more as, as highly motivated and persevering. I just feel like I don't want to give up. And I think that um, that's something that my students and my collaborators have, have shared with me. Um, we just, you know, try to find find a way. Thank you, Hari. Uh, we have one question in, in, in Zoom from Hesham. He asks, uh, what is the best way for the application to communicate its requirements to the network? Yeah, this is a great question. I was hoping to touch on this. I actually think that these ideas where applications communicate their requirements have failed with few exceptions because most applications just want everything. And I've been involved with writing applications myself and I just don't know. I think one of the successes of network applications has been adaptation. So I think it's the network's job to provide in a succinct way uh, information about what the network is doing. And I don't think applications need to know the details of a lot of stuff. They just wanna know, you know, perhaps with a few bits, great, good, bad. I mean, it's kind of just index on that and then adapt accordingly. Is my delay going up or down? It's simple stuff that if we provide some simple feedback, applications can adapt and they should adapt. And I think that's a better way forward rather than a explicit, uh, here's what I want. Now that said, um, while I've been somewhat skeptical of the use of sort of black box AI in networking, I actually think AI can help in two ways. One is it can inspire human design by being an assistant to human beings and design, designing better systems and protocols. And the other is AI could actually probably be used to infer application intent in a way that even the application designer might not have known. And by inferring that perhaps networks could do better. So I would probably respectfully reject the idea that applications should specify anything but instead emphasize adaptation and perhaps the use of inference from the network, but without, you know, with, with realizing that you might get it wrong. Thank you, Hari. Um, we have one question from uh, Sergey on, uh, on Slack. If we do not know, why not just publish and record all the papers? I think this is a question from the last yeah. part of your talk. Well, I mean, I think there's a value in vetting. Uh, re the review process that we have is absolutely fantastic. It does work, make work better. I'm just questioning whether the third and fourth and fifth reviews that I think every single person here 
including the absolute luminaries in the field, like you know, Professor Schenker. We've all had more rejections than we care about for the same damn work. We gotta stop this. It's just congestion collapse. At some point, you just say, listen, I may not believe in, and often it boils down to whether they think the problem is real or can be deployed. Like it's not about whether the idea is correct or wrong. Because the idea is not correct, because something technical is wrong with it. No one here is continuing to pushing a wrong, uh, continue pushing a wrong idea. So I do think beyond, I mean, reviewing matters, but there's a lot of diminishing returns. It's a, it's a utility function that is extremely concave. After a while, there's no point. Yeah, after a while, we should publish it. But I don't think we should publish everything. There's a value in the vetting. The ideas do get better. But I, I just question whether they get better after a while. Yep. Uh, we have a Sorry, Scott, for putting you on the, on the spot. I just didn't want to say that I'm the only one with lots of rejections. <laughs> I think it's proportional to the number of papers you submit as well. <laughs> I'm not so sure. I think there are things that just go on and on. And sometimes you just think, let's put this out of misery. And I do think that memory in the reviewing process will help. True, true, agreed. So a follow-up uh, question or comment from Ben Az. Uh, I'm curious why we are not talking about the science and the scientific implication of our work. We have talked about acceptance rate, practicality, and other things. But at the end of the day, isn't research supposed to be to advance science? Well, I like to think of us as an engineering field. And I think there's nothing wrong with that. I think engineering is just as valuable to the intellectual endeavor as science. Um, there are scientific aspects to our field, but I think that we should be proud of the fact that um, we're, you know, many of us are engineers and I think of myself as an engineer first as a, and as a scientist next. And I think there's tremendous intellectual depth and value in engineering. Completely agree. Completely agree. Um, so we have three questions and I think after that we'll be out of time. Uh, but if you have follow on questions, please post them on Slack. I'll maybe email them to Hari. Uh, so one question on Slack from Gire is, thinking about the networks in about 10 years from now, how do you think they will be different from our current networks? Gee, I wish I knew. Um, what, I will, what, what I think I will say, I'll talk about um, wireless a little bit because that's something I know a little bit more about. And then maybe, um, in, in or at least I may have something more unique to say. Um, I, I do think that we're going to reach the point where uh, wireless will provide better throughput and performance than wire connections to the home. It's starting to happen. But I think that if you look at it in terms of the overall cost, if you think of it um, in those terms, I think that will happen. I think it's already starting to happen in places like India today. Um, and what that will mean is that one thing that I can be certain of is, or maybe not certain, one thing I believe is that the nature of the bottleneck keeps changing. You know, we recently have been trying to publish a paper which talks about, or actually multiple uh, pieces of work, which talks about what happens if the network bottleneck is not at the edges or at the end points. And people say, oh, it's not real. The core doesn't have a bottleneck. You know, I'm, I, unfortunately I'm old enough to be, you know, have gone through these cycles where the bottleneck has shifted from the core to the edge, to the core to the edge. I think this will change. And it's quite likely that 10 years from now, there will be entire network pads where it's not that last mile that's the bottleneck, but the last mile may have a lot more variability. So I think there's a few things that I think will happen. One is that I do think networks will become even more variable. That is the peak to average may change quite a bit and that'll be by design because they'll allocate spectrum or resources more dynamically. Mobility will remain a fundamentally difficult problem to solve because there's a lot of physical impact that happens. Um, and I think that the nature of the bottleneck will change. Uh, so maybe that's a more unique answer than um, perhaps you might hear from other experts in the field. Yeah, that's perfect. Um, that's a great answer. And I think I agree with pretty much all of it. Um, one the question from Marino is, if you had to pick a single piece of work you have done, which would that be your preferred one? I don't know, it's like trying to pick your favorite child. <laughs> it's really for others to say, um, I've really enjoyed working on many of them. And often I found that, I mean, this is interesting. Often I found that the project and the, uh, that I've had the most, uh, most fun with are a uh, little bit less about the project per se than about the people themselves. Ultimately we're a community and we're very collaborative. And for me personally, I've tended to never work alone. And uh, it's been gated a lot by my enjoyment has been very proportionate to how enjoyable it's been to work with the other people. And I've pretty much enjoyed every project because of that. Okay. 
And the last question uh, is, what would your advice be for starting researchers in the field? That's a great question to end on. I think. Yeah, it's a great question to end on. I think you <clears> should <throat> find your own path. Um, all advice should be taken with, you know, like you take it as an input and you apply your filter. And I hope that what I have indicated to people here is that don't think of yourself as an outsider. Frankly, most of the experts don't know anything. We're just as unclear. We just think we know more because of experience, but don't confuse wisdom for creativity or knowledge. Uh, in fact, I think there's a lot to be said for, you know, if you think about it, why do universities end up um, having an outsized influence on research compared to even extremely well-funded industrial labs or um, why does it look like professors have an impact? It's because of the students, it's because of these new ideas that come in. So I think we overrate experience in many cases um, and the new ideas often come from people who've never done it before. But now the question is, how do you get started? And there's a lot of daunting stuff. It looks like I have to learn all this to get started. And I think there's a lot of technology you have to understand or a lot of operational stuff you have to understand or a lot of theory you have to understand. Well, I think what I hope I've communicated is take an application that you're interested in, any application, perhaps that'll excite you. And you'll find that there's diamonds in the rock to be plumbed and to be, to be um, obtained. And then you have to have the ability to generalize. But for me personally, what has worked are new applications or even old applications. So maybe that's a path forward for some of you.